There was actually, you know how those clinic dinners go, um, where there's like, like Buck goes out to dinner and then there's a lot of people. And so I ended up just sitting next to her at dinner and, um, overheard her and her friend talking. And I was like, Oh, do you have dogs? And then Ricky was like, she doesn't just like, she's like the dog person. And I was like, Oh, okay. And then, so we visited about that a little bit and yeah, saw her the next day at the clinic and yeah, kind of, um, had a good conversation and more we talked i was like man it sounds like we got to get um you know jack on the podcast and i was telling her i was like we should do an episode with jack and then down the line we should do one with you too because um both of you guys do clinics don't you jack you kind of trade off we do yeah yeah where um, where you been recently and my last one was in Seattle, and I was in Virginia before that, and Indiana before that. So, wow. So, do you, do you stay pretty was, busy most of the year traveling like that? Yeah, pretty much. It's either me or Kathy. Kathy's at one. I'm home, and I, we pass <laughs> each other on the road. I think. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that was, um, and that was another thing. Um, I don't know if Kathy mentioned it to you, Jack, but we were just, like I said, visiting there at dinner. Um, and she said, uh, y'all used to live really close to Lexington, Virginia back in the day. Yeah. That's where, when Kathy and me got married, we went to Virginia. So. Okay, cool. So I'm, uh, I'm about 90 minutes down the road from Lexington down 81. Where about? Blacksburg. Oh, I know where Blacksburg is. Yeah. Yeah. I used to go down there for fencing at that time. I used to do a lot of uh, work with West Virginia fence on the side. I built a lot of oh, fence. Yeah. yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. My, um, yeah, I know my dad before the cattle, cattle deal got, um, enough that that was his full-time job he he did some fencing um down this way and then so, uh but mainly he was like a dealer like a fencing supply dealer okay uh, yeah uh-huh so yeah oh, but really? that was kind of funny because she she was talking about that and i was like yeah i actually spent a lot of time up there um you know grew up around the rock bridge fox hunt up there oh yes um, yeah yeah so um that's a that's a neat little part of the world Lexington yeah. area. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the world. I, when I did the book, the, the publisher come from down near Blacksburg. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's. So. Yeah. Small world. So, wow. um, I don't know if you saw the deal, but we're, we're recording now. Yeah. Jack. Uh-huh. Um, and so for the people listening, Let's give them some context. Um, you know, I, knock on wood. Kathy mentioned she was like, well, I hope you guys will be able to um, understand everything Jack is saying. And I, I feel like I can understand you perfectly. I don't really have that sort of deal. But you're not originally from the United States, right? Even though you all live in Missouri now. No, I'm from Scotland. Um, okay. I came to the United States in 1971. Okay. So long time American then. A long, longer American than Scottish, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And, um, and in Scotland, did you, I, I guess, did you grow up in like farm country, I assume? Yeah, I was... My dad was on the farm all his life, you know, and so I grew up on a farm basically all my life. And all I wanted to do was be a shepherd and tend to sheep and train dogs. And that was a yeah. lifetime dream of mine. Yeah, yes, that's there. cool. Yeah. So, like over over in Scotland, would would being a shepherd be sort of like the equivalent to being an American cowboy, or or like have at least the same kind of mystique? Where if it's something yeah, it, you, you want to do and it's a lifestyle? Yeah, it would be much the same. I would say um, 
That would have been my next choice to be a cowboy. <laughs> you see, <laughs> <like you. laughs> but that was just dreams, you know. <laughs> yeah. Did you have yeah. cowboys or people like cowboys in Scotland that rode horses and herded cows? Not that way? really. It was more of when television came out, you saw more of it and things like that, you know. But uh, yeah, oh, man. No, it's just it's been a pretty interesting life for me. It just started from zeros, and I would, if I was told I would be doing what I do today, I would have said you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but here I am. <laughs> Yeah. So growing up, I, I guess, you know, you grew up on the farm there and you guys, you were running sheep. Is that what your dad was, was a shepherd? Or? No, he was actually what they called a farm grievey. He ran the, the farm and the men on the farm, you know, he was in charge of it. Okay. And right up to his latter years, he, he was a farm manager for a while and then he took over sheep then. But I had a brother that was a shepherd, my oldest brother. And I just always loved the sheep and the dogs and the, and the livestock side. Of, you know, it was always just a passion of mine. And as a little boy, I used to go out and draw in the sand and make fields and sheep and dogs. <laughs> it's kind of crazy when you think back. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. So we, you know, we have a quite a variety of guests on here, but that, that story right there reminds me of, um, one of the first guests we ever had was a farrier and, uh, he, uh, his family ran like a pack string down in North Carolina. Um, and so they had a bunch of horses to shoe. Um, yeah. and his, he remembers his dad and his uncle shoeing all the time. And he said, yeah, I was, I was four years old and I went into the shoe and shed and was like, working on trying to shoe my pony when they found me <laughs> and, and you know now he's one of the better known farriers in the eastern united states and huh. it's just funny how you know if you're gonna like a, a lot of people who end up being successful at what they do they have kind of like childhood stories like that yeah like, one way or another yeah well this my dream was just to be i remember getting my first job as a shepherd i, I left school when i was 15 and and I worked at home for a year, and I saw this shepherd's ad. There was an advertisement in the paper for a young shepherd, and I said to my dad about it, and he said, you don't have experience, it's not worth it. And, but I finally talked him into allowing me to apply for it, and I got the job. And that's when I first started shepherding. Wow. So what, um, you know, a, a young kid who has no experience – What's kind of the pitch um, to get someone to hire you into that deal? I mean, that, did did you know a lot? Like, like for example, if someone was going to hire a, a young guy to be like a ranch hand, yeah, he he could say, "Well, I can shoe horses, and I can I can ride pretty well, and I can, you know, I can I can rope half decent, and I can read cattle, like you know, when they're sick and things." Like, yeah. so so what is what does that pitch look like for you when you're a, a kid trying to get a shepherding job? A little the same. When I was a little kid, you know, if I could toddle behind the shepherds, I was toddling behind them. And, and like when I got my school vacation, I was away to my brothers and I would be there all summer. I would go with them every day to the round the, the mountains. And so I grew up just knowing all about sheep and shepherding and, it was just something I always loved, so and followed it on, and never thought I would ever be doing what I'm doing today. But yeah. the dog side, I always loved the dogs, but I never, never even thought I would compete with dogs or anything, you know. Mm. Wow, were competitions with dogs something you saw fairly often at that point in life? Yeah, well, well I, you know, when I was in my teens, I would go to a dog trial every week in life. Never compete, but I would go and watch. Mm -hmm. And I would be there in the morning, I would be there tonight and sit and watch dogs and listen to the dog people tell stories. And I think that's how we learn most. You can learn a lot from hearing stories. It's. Uh, Hey there, On The Move listener. Do you enjoy listening to this podcast? 
if you've made it this far in the episode, I assume you do. But you never know. I could just be talking to someone's house cat at this point. But if you are there and you like the podcast, the best thing you can do to help support our journey to keep this thing going is to find us on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, leave a rating, leave a review, get on social media, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube. The more we can grow this, the easier it's going to become for us to put out episodes every week and get awesome guests so we can learn and stay on the move just like you. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like you uh, you feel like greatness will rub off on you if you can spend enough time around it. Um, well, I never what, what thought type of, Sorry. What type of, oh, that's all right. I, we might, you and I might have a little delay. What what type of people were competing? Were were a lot of them working guys, um, or were there? Is there like another class of you know people that just use the dogs for show, but maybe didn't actually work the dogs? On sheep. Back then, dogs was maybe more used for everyday work. Uh, the shepherds and farmers and like at the International Sheepdog Society trials, which is basically the daddy of them all. That's everybody's dream is to win the British International. And there was a farmer's class and, and the shepherd's class and then the overall winner, you know, and so... That was the big dream for a lot of people, but it was just a thing that that was people's enjoyment on a weekend. You know, they would go with their dogs and go to the trial and compete and just have fun and enjoy it. It's gotten way more competitive today than it used to be. Yeah. What was what was your childhood like as far as time split between school and work? Did you have a very fairly rigorous uh, school? that you had to attend as well? We was at school every day, but uh, I left school, like I said, when I was 15, and I couldn't wait to get away from school. I just never was interested in school, to be <laughs> honest. I was thinking about the farm when I should have been thinking about things in school. It was just, yeah. uh, you know, my mind was always away on another sort of planet. Yeah. Well, like, like Joe alluded to, you clearly were already, you were already pursuing your passion that, yeah. um, that ultimately yeah. it, it worked out as a good thing in the end. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so at what point did you, did you decide to move to America or is that, is that the first place you left um, to move to from Scotland? I, I moved a little bit around in Scotland. I had maybe one, two, three shepherds' jobs. I drove uh, livestock trucks for a little while. And, you know, as a young guy, he wanted to make more money, so he did anything to. But the lure is shepherding, just, and it never got away from me. And I got back to that and then got talked into running a dog at a sheepdog trial one day. And that was a big deal because I don't think I would ever have went if my father and sister didn't hadn't been with me. I was so nervous I didn't want to go and run the dog. Hmm. So that was when that all started was the trial scene, you know, it was way back. I would be about 26 when I ran my first dog in a, in a competition. But I trained a lot of dogs before that, you know, and told with them. Was there a competition learning curve you, even though like for example could a fella make a pretty handy dog out on the farm but if they he'd never been in a competition he might not have everything he needs um to succeed yet well i think he you know the thing about when i look back on life today i think about that and i I think I had as good dogs on the farm as I ever have had in trials. Hmm. You know, it was all in your mind and what you wanted and how much you wanted out of the dog. And since going away back, when I look away back in these days, you know, I used to think I knew a lot and I knew nothing. <laughs> it's yeah. the dog it knows. It's not the it's not the the, the handler or the trainer. In the past five or six years. I would say that dogs 
teach me, I don't teach dogs. It all comes from them. And coming to America was all through the dogs. I mean, I, I had no intentions of coming to America. And I just got the opportunity through someone came to look at one of my dogs. And that's how we all started off. Wow. How about that? Well, clearly, I mean, clearly you were working at it and, and developed um, enough of a skill that somebody wanted you to come over. Um, Jack, there was a Joe had recommended um, that I watch a, a couple of look you up on YouTube before we did the episode. And um, I didn't get a chance to watch a lot, but I did watch a little bit of an interview. And um, it's interesting on there. You were talking about, I, you know, I was doing some other things at the same time. So I, I missed a little bit of it, but yeah. I kept hearing you say respect. I kept hearing you say respect as you were talking. And even just yeah. now, when you mentioned your first competition yeah. and how you were. Respect is the main there. thing in a dog's life. Yeah. And you, you said it was it's so amazing. I respect is the main thing in life. Yeah. And so could you just talk a little bit more about what that felt like to how, like, how did that come about that you were in the competition? Did someone ask you or did you go sign up for it? And is that something, could you just talk about how that happened a little bit? Cause I, I, it's easy when you're young to strive for things to come along, but not just work at it and allow the opportunity to come. And were you aware of, of how you were going about it at the time? Well, I think it all started off, you know, as a shepherd, you know, when I first started shepherding, he's only allowed two dogs. He wasn't allowed to keep a lot of dogs. Um, and as time went on, that changed, and I started getting young dogs and training them and selling them just to make extra pocket money. And we thought it got pretty good. And I was at, there was a big uh, agricultural show in, in Scotland every year. It's called Kelsha Show. And it's quite a big deal. And we happened to be there one day. And a bunch of us young guys was in the beer tent, of course, and was all bragging about their dogs. And all of a sudden, someone came along and touched one of us on the shoulder and said, well, okay, we've got a novice trial coming up in Salton. So everybody started entering. And by the end, I'm thinking, well, I've got to enter too. And that's how I first went into a trial. <laughs> or I would possibly never be <laughs> Huh. Oh, that's a heck so, of a story. So it was all thanks, all thanks to the beer tent, huh? It was all to the beer tent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes having fun can lead to lots of things. But you have to respect the fun you have. Just the same as the dog. And there's nothing taught me about respect more than the dog says. Hmm. I think a lot of people don't... Um, they know the word respect, but they don't think about it a lot. But my dogs make me think. Hmm. And right now, when I go in my kennel, I watch my dogs. And my dogs watch me. And they don't go crazy, and they're not wagging their tail, they're all excited, they're thinking. They're wondering what I'm going to do. That's respect. Respecting each other. What are we going to do for each other? I'm not a believer anymore in making a dog do anything. I want my dog to want to do it for me, the same as I want to do and help the dog. Mm. So I've got a got one question for you about that. Um, you know, you said most people don't understand the meaning of the word respect. Is yeah. there like one adjective, one word, action word you would put with respect? And for people, like what, what's the one thing you think is the most important for someone to understand in order to show respect or understand respect? I think the word I would go to would be trust. If, I, if you, you know, you can have a lot of friends, but there's certain friends you trust a hundred percent, maybe more than a hundred percent. And that's the same as my dog. I mean, I trust them. I don't go out. I'm not a competitive person. I never have been, really. I like to compete and enjoy it, but, I mean, it's watching a dog 
give what it's got to give. That's respecting your dog. And if you're a good trainer, you should look at that and give back to that dog what it's given to you. And to me, to me nowadays, I think competition is being driven the other way. It's all a, a sport to win. It's all about winning. It's not about how you win. It's more about how you win. I don't want to win if I don't respect the way my dog runs or handles the livestock or does the job. It's all about if you're a shepherd, you should respect the stock you're taking care of. And, and you know, it's a word that goes in lots of things for in my vocabulary anyway. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, I got to ask you then too. How, how did you do in that first competition? Did you come in pretty high? Well, I was about the last dog to run. And like I said, I was a nervous wreck and I ran and my little dog just ran. She couldn't have run better. And I wasn't in the top 10, but my idol was there. The man I kind of idolized myself after was the late Jock Richardson, who owned Western Cup, a very famous dog. And he came over at the end of that trial and he said to me, never do you mind, laddie, you'll be in the winner's circle someday. And that meant more to me than winning that trial. I've never forgotten these words. And I knew him most of his life, didn't know him really well, but I watched him a lot and listened to everything he had to say. Hmm. Wow, that's yeah. powerful. That's like out of a movie right there. <laughs> well, it's it's true. It's you know, it's I can go back and all these things. I can remember when I all the times I ever talked to that guy and yeah. Yeah, that's pretty special. Have you ever put the first ride on a colt in a muddy arena? Or maybe you've tried preg checking a group of cows in a thunderstorm. Maybe you're not even the animal type, but we've all crawled under our pickup truck to change the oil in a parking lot. And eventually we had to head in the store and buy a cheap tarp in that vain attempt to keep the water off our sacred project. Well, that'll work for so long. And when you're at home, it just gets older and older. What you need is a roof and you need a quality structure and one made of good American steel built to last a lifetime. Well, that's something worthwhile investing in. Heck, you might even decide to make a barn dominium. You know, people are doing that these days. So if you've been working on your farm or ranch for a while, or you're just getting started on a place and you've been wanting to build and the price has been holding you back, or you couldn't find a good manufacturer to work with, now is the time to look into that steel building you've been wanting to build. And the folks you need to look into are Metal Material Direct. They also offer a revolutionary octagon steel fencing system. This fencing system can be used for arena fences, corrals, working pens, as well as a heavy-duty fence that can be dressed up or down, depending on if it's for your lawn or used as a commercial fence around your farm or business. They use a revolutionary clip design, which allows those of you who don't weld to put this stuff together. It'd be perfect for you. Head over to www.metalmdi.com slash on the move, and there you'll find their 3D configurator. It allows you to plug in your dimensions and specifications for that building you want to build and see it as a finished project. So in conclusion, head on over to www.metalmdi.com slash on the move and get a custom quote for your new steel building, garage, shop, barn dominium, or fencing system. And be sure and let them know the guys at On The Move sent you. So with the dog deal, I, I don't have, you know, I've been around dogs all my life, even been around a handful of stock dogs. And, um, but, but I don't claim to know anything about training dogs. When, when you get a dog to train and you're, you know, we don't, this doesn't need to become a seminar on the, the whole training dog deal. Cause we're kind of more interested in, in your story. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you get a dog in, um, you know, whether it's 
I, I assume do you get it get them when they're weaned? Is that kind of when you start? Well, nowadays I raise a lot of my own puppies, uh, but okay. I get dogs at all day. I used to go to Scotland and buy a lot of dogs for customers and bring them back and train them. And uh, yeah, so, so I gained a lot of experience just through doing things like that. But yeah, I don't know. The question you're possibly asking me is: when I get a dog, what's the where do I go? What do I look for? Well, I'm curious. So, for example, Ben and I, you know, we ride horses for the public. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times that can be starting a two-year-old colt. Um, and then other times it can be, you know, kind of a little bit of an outlaw that's maybe like 10 years old and mm -hmm. just hasn't had a lot of structure in its life. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know horses and dogs are different, but I think it's fair to say there's a lot of parallels in interacting between humans and the two species. So what does, what does it look like the process of, of kind of getting that respect? Like for example, horses, Ben and I have always been taught it's getting to the feet. You know, it, if you can get to the feet, you can kind of start having a dialogue with that horse because that's what really means something to them. So for a dog, you know, it, is that foundation of respect like from day one is, and, and if so, like how do you lay that out there and, and does it build from there? Can, I, I'd just be curious to hear you elaborate on all that. Well, first of all, when I hear you say that, what makes the feet work? The mind. Well, uh, and that's the, that's the famous so rain. So right. I go into the mind. I never yeah, think about anything else. I go to the dog's mind and I try to, whether it's a five-year-old or a puppy or, you know, just a young dog I'm starting, I want to see what he's thinking. And at one time when I trained, I used to think I could make everything right. But nowadays, I don't believe that anymore. I never try to make anything. When I see a dog struggling, I wonder why why is that dog struggling? So what am I reading at that point? I'm reading that dog's mind to find out how I can help him. A lot of training is done by force on the mind or pressure on the mind to make the mind, to make the feet work, to make the dog give. Or I try to get that dog where he wants to read my mind the same as I'm reading him. So when I'm changing the tone in my voice, that dog's reading my voice. It's not what I say to him. It's how I say it. It's not the word. It's the, how we say it. And that dog can feel it. And if you have a right connection, you'll find it. that dog will just float in the end of your voice. Hmm. And I find a lot of dogs today that, especially dogs when I do clinics, I might not see them again for six months. And these dogs will come running up these. They'll just they know me. So dogs has taught me that. I didn't know that, but dogs teach you that they can t touch all the special things the same as we can. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. I'm a huge believer in the mind. Everything goes through a dog's mind, whether it lifts its tail, wags its tail. And I'm always amazed at people, you know, they get a puppy and the first thing they do is want to spoil it and tell it how good it is. They don't look to see if the puppy's good. It's always good. So what are you doing to your mind when you do that? You're teaching it the wrong things. You're not teaching it to think. So I have a big thing in me and just my philosophy in dogs nowadays is I'm not a big believer in praise. Praise is something we all love. We all want it. But do we need it? Look at corrections, none of us want them. But if you get a correction the right way, you're going to be a happy person. And that's what I feel about a dog. If that dog gets that correction and feels it, it wants to give you five things more as it's maybe able to give even. Hmm. So it's all about freedom to be wrong, correct the wrongs, leave the rights alone. 
Not that I never praise my dog, don't get me wrong, but I mean, I think it praises overrated, you know. Mm. Sure. That, that's very interesting because sure. if you think about the people, at least in my life, people I know that are pretty, uh, you know, high output individuals um, and, and have good work ethic and are kind and it's nice people to be around, but they're good workers. They don't need much praise either. There's yeah. just a contentment yeah. in the work and they understand yeah. hard work is good for them. And the, and the more they yeah. become successful, the less they look for praise and adoration. Yeah. And the people that look for praise just they really don't get much done um yeah. except for maybe the little bit they needed to do to get a, a pat on the back and uh that's a pretty neat correlation I'm feel, sure there's something to that i sometimes feel that way like about winners you know yeah everybody wants to win but everybody can't win there's only one person first i don't want to spend the rest of my life being unhappy just because i didn't win there's a lot in trying to win. I always say that getting better is the best guy or the best person. As long as you're getting better, you're going to reach your goal. Hmm. So, well, that that reminds me of something you said on that video I watched. You said um, it had to do with the respect, but you said just the fact that you're there in the competition is something. Like there's yeah. a bunch of people watching. There's a lot of people that yeah. don't even own a dog, or yeah. don't even have an enjoyable occupation. So you're there, you're you're in the field trials. That's an accomplishment. And so yeah. you're not going to win until you at least enter the trials first. And so even if no. you don't win the first time, that's one of the steps you have to take yeah. to ever make it to the winner's circle. Yeah. And and that's a tough perspective to keep in the the front of your mind. Especially when you're a young, ambitious guy full of testosterone trying to trying yeah. to get it. Yeah, I think that, um, don't get me wrong, if I go to a competition, I'm going to try to win, but it's not the not my main goal. You know, if I go and my dog runs good and I'm happy the way the dog ran and the dog was happy, that's, that's my goal. I mean, that's what a trial is to me. It's... It's a competition to go and test each other's dogs and um, sometimes when you go out to be a winner, you win at any cost. I mean, they don't care how to win as long as they get the reward. Well, uh, it's no for me. I just, I, I'm more into I love to see talent. I love to see dogs or animals. The same as horses, you know. I've I've been lucky enough to travel. I've done, went to a lot of different deals. I mainly go into the snuffle bit futurity out in Arizona one year. I did a demo there, and I just sat among a lot of the people that had horses, and they were asking me about this horse and that horse. And I said, ah, I don't care for that one. Not too much spur, and and they say, like, ah, you know, such a dummy. <laughs> But, you know, it's all about what you want and it's what you need. And, and, and to me, that when I look back in my life and think of what dogs have done for it, it's just unbelievable. Hmm. They've done what no humans has ever taught me. They've taught me far more. Yeah. So I'm still interested in this whole story and you touched on it a little bit what was you know you're you're kind of a young man and and you got your start in the trials there and you were shepherding around scotland what was the catalyst that in, made you move to the united states because it kind of it sounds a little bit like in terms of what your goals were at the time you were kind of at the epicenter of that you you were in you know sheep country you were in dog country um and so what, what made you want to make the move to the United States? Hey, On The Move listener. Have you been following us on social media? Have you been watching the video format of the podcasts? If so, you've probably noticed by now that we have On The Move merch. I'm wearing one of our hats right now. The first order of hats we did flew off the shelves, and we've only got a handful left in each style. 
but we're doing another order. And if you want to pre-order your On The Move hat today, go to www.onthemovepodcast.com. There you'll find our Shopify store with hats, mugs, stickers, and other merch. Get it just in time for the holiday season and let everyone know that you're on the move. Well, the truth is I, I didn't want him to move, but there was a, a guy over from the United States uh, buying dogs in Scotland. And he came to see my dog one on a Sunday or a Monday morning and I showed him the dog and we was just talking outside the house and all of a sudden he, he said, you have a beautiful place to stay in. I said, yeah, it's a pity I have to give it up next year. And he didn't buy my dog and he left and I just never thought I would ever see him again. And about maybe two weeks later, I met him at a sheepdog trial one day and he came over and talked to me and he said, Remember, he said he was going to have to give up your position. He says he wouldn't by any chance be interested in going to America. And I said, no, me, not my wildest dreams. And he went on and on and on. And I finally said, look, you're wasting your time. I'm not interested. And he finally said, well, if you don't mind, I have a friend in North Carolina. He was an ex-state senator, one of the Scotsmen to come out and work his dogs. And he said he, has, he owns a big ranch. He might get on to running the whole operation. And I said, well, thank you very much, but it's just no for me. And then I finally said, he said, well, if you don't mind, I will take your name and address. You can negotiate with the guy, and if you decide to go, fine, and if you don't, there'll be no hard feelings. So that's how it all happened. And I started negotiating, and I thought, if I don't do this, I'm going to regret it all my life. So we kind of sold out and moved to America. Wow. Yeah. And what what age were you when you moved? I would be 31 when I come over. Okay. And I came to uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It was right on the edge of Winston-Salem where, where I started. Oh, no kidding. Okay, yeah. just down the road. You know, for you had the Bermuda run, there's a big golf course there. It's just on the west side of Winston Salem. Okay. But, yeah. Very cool. And and with that, so I, I guess, did you start working at the the farm or ranch that he had there? And you were kind I of. I came and worked at the ranch. I came in the December and went to Delaware in the following June day, my first trial. And I took four dogs and I was first thing, third and fifth at that first trial. And that kind of started just on the, on the roll and then went to Kentucky the following week and I was second there. And everything just kind of started to grow a little bit. But it was a funny thing, when I went to that first trial, I just met somebody just like meeting you, and this guy and his daughter was there, and uh, he came and talked to me about my dogs, and I didn't you know, not think anything about it, but he left, and two weeks later, he sent me a bunch of pictures he had taken of my dogs, and I wrote and thanked them, and uh, we just became friends, and he finally bought a dog from me, and three years later, it's when I moved to Wisconsin and went into a partnership with him. Mm. So it was just kind of like a fairy tale story, you know. But yeah, that's <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Um, how how did the the class of competition in the United States when you first started compare to Scotland? Did you feel like you m maybe went down to a lower league because it's not as competitive here, or is it just kind of a different deal? How did how did that work? In these days, it wasn't as competitive. I mean, there wasn't near as many trials in the United States as there is today. I mean, it's it's grown leaps and bounds, and I mean, it's it's still growing. I mean, it's I don't know where it'll stop. But when I run in Scotland, there used to be a novice class, but 
when you ran in the novice class, you actually also ran it. It was an open course. You ran the whole, the same as the open dogs. And then you had an N behind your name in the novice class. So I, that's all I did when I was in Scotland was run in the novice class and then I trained dogs. And and I never ran an O until I come to the United States. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> and so... So you you've arrived in North Carolina, and I guess that 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 had to be kind of a good deal for you at the time because it sounded like this guy was that part of the deal. Like he wanted you to go to these trials, and like was there a big emphasis on the dogs on in this outfit you were working for? Yeah, and uh, actually, Fred Banson was the guy's name. is Senator Banson, and but he he was also president of the North American Sheepdog Society. So he was interested in, in getting his dogs into trials and building his kennel name up. and So that's kind of where it all started from. Uh, okay. Because so, that's, you know, the, the, the parallel in the horse world would be you could, you could go some places and, and maybe it's a, it, it's a working ranch and you're horseback a lot, but kind of the cattle – are the main driver, right? Yeah. And then you can have other places where it's it's a ranch, but you know maybe they show their horses or maybe they breed horses, and you have the cattle there and they're you know part of the income and their business, but the horses might be a little more of the financial driver. Um, and it it seems to me like you could kind of have some parallels with your deal, and if you're really interested in the dogs you might want to find the situation where the dogs are the driver as opposed to having like a great giant flock and you get a chance to use your dogs every day, but you're maybe not getting sent to these competitions. Yeah, I would say you're 100% correct. I mean, it used to be that the sheep and the cattle was why people kept dogs, but now they keep sheep and cattle for dogs. It's completely turned around. As far as making a living, you know, I don't think I would want to raise a lot of sheep to make a living nowadays. It's yeah. it's, it's completely swung to the side the side of the dogs, and much the same as in the horses, like your your cutting on your all your different sports with horses. You know, it's it's the same idea, and you know. So now when you were in Scotland, that, that actually brings up a point that I wanted to ask you too. When you were in Scotland, were there, um, was it all sheep or were people using their dogs on cattle at all? No cattle and sheep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'd use our dogs and whatever we needed them for, you know, uh, but they were basically when I first started, it was a work tool. It wasn't, uh, you know, and then trials kind of came more into the the picture. And even since I left there and come to the United States, it's way more into the picture, you know. I mean, the dogs in, in the United States today, are, are, it's just unbelievable to me where they went. Hmm. And, and with the cattle and sheep, Again, I don't know anything about training dogs. Is that is that something like if you had a young dog, you maybe start him on sheep and then graduate to cattle, or can he go straight to cattle and it's not a big difference? Um, like, <laughs> how do you address that, or is there much difference in working the two species? I think it really depends on people. Um, myself, I don't think there's any difference. If I was giving advice to anybody, I would say get some sheep to train your dog on. Um, because a lot of cattle people feel they have to bite a cow to make it move. Well, when I was a little boy growing up, I can remember them telling me a good dog never needs to bite a sheep. And yet today in trials, people will say, you'll never move these sheep without biting them, and I disagree with them. Hmm. I think we're breeding dogs and animals wrong. We're not looking at what we need. We're looking for winners. 
Winners is not always what you need. And the quality of dogs, for me, is not as good as it used to be. The training and expertise in training dogs is way superior. But there's a lot of people nowadays, just like myself, it's making a living out of training dogs. And basically, instead of making a living out of training dogs, um, Kathy and I do a lot of seminars and teach other people how to train them. And that has become this huge. And all of that has come through competition, if I look back. I mean, when I moved to Wisconsin and went into the partnership, I did that for a year and a half, and, and then it wasn't working. The dogs was just carrying the place. And I talked to the guy, and he said, well, I'm a year off retirement. He says, if you'll, if you'll stay, I'll lease you the farm. So he leased me the farm, and I went to Scotland, and I bought some dogs, and I started my kennel. And not with the dogs I wanted, but with what I could afford. And uh, I've never stopped building that. I mean, that's the main part for me is the dogs that's in my kennel. I want the right tool. I don't want to be working with dogs that's the wrong tool. I'm not looking for winners. I'm looking for talented dogs that's got. There's three things a dog needs in its power. Well, balance first. Balance is just basically a pressure point to handle livestock, whether it's a cow or a sheep, it doesn't even matter. And uh, power second and style third. And I used to think it style didn't matter a lot, but the more I studied, the more I understand it. When we watch a dog work with style, what does the animal that it's working work watch? You know, when you bite a cow, I don't think a cow likes being bitten. Or a sheep. But just many people think that. They don't think that way because when they bite, the cow moves or the sheep moves. But does it move right? No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Because that's no link in the mind to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So we're back on the mind. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you see the exact same thing with with working cattle, um, certainly in horse training, but a lot of that with working cattle, where um, a guy will will put way too much pressure on a cow, and then not yeah. take any pressure off. And yeah, yeah. they're moving the cow, but yeah. that's what makes um, those legendary cattlemen so cool to watch because they're getting so much done. It looks like they're hardly doing anything. Um, or even great horsemen that we watch. Um, they're they're doing what you said. They're operating so much less with force and so much more with their mind. Um, yeah. But that kind of led me around. I wanted to ask you, you know, because you've been teaching these people. And like in the horse world, um, you know, I think we're, we're striving for the same kind of thing. We, we want to do, well, Ray Hunt, you probably know who Ray Hunt was, right? And Ray yeah. always said, um, you want to do, as little as possible, but as much as is necessary. Yeah. That kind of sums that up a little bit, right? Yeah. And um, But with the horses, I understand, you know, even for somebody who's not that good or if you're teaching people, um, there's a lot of basic, very, uh, you know, practical things you can do. Until you understand more, more of the feel and have a good mindset, you can, like, physically put your body in the right place and hold your flag and your lead rope and, and – kind of get the horse under control and gain a little ground. Um, when you're teaching people with dogs, is that, um, I'm just trying to figure out, is that a lot more difficult to work with people and their dogs? Cause maybe you don't have as many like physical things that are really basic you can work with and you're trying to get them to use their voice and their demeanor. Cause I know people are, people are a tough bird to work with, right? It's one thing to get somebody to hold a flag and a rope, but it's another thing to get someone to get their emotions under control and talk in different ways and not get frustrated or be commanding or or be more meek, whatever it is. Um, and I don't know how much time you've spent around people teaching horsemanship, um, but would you would you say trying to teach people how to train their dog or even just use their dog is a pretty difficult thing to do? Yeah, I would say it is very difficult 
But the one thing that came to my mind when you were saying all this was back to the dog itself. The dog taught me how to teach people. And people will not look at the dog. They'll, they'll look at what they want the dog to do, but they don't look at the dog. So I want to take you back to a story, and this is a long time ago. I was doing a clinic in Virginia. And there was a very good friend of mine at the clinic. He was a little bit older than I was, and I'd got to know him over the years. And he used to room with me, and I was getting ready to go to bed the night before the clinic. And he says, you know, Jack, you're always playing pranks on us. He says, I was going to play one on you tomorrow. But he said, I'm kind of taking cold feet. And I said, what's that, Frank? He said, well, he says, I've got this dog, and all it wants to do is kill a sheep. And I said, it can't be that bad. He said, I'm telling you, I'll kill a sheep at your feet. And I says, what are you going to do with it? He says, I'm going to take it back home and have it put down. And I've no idea why I said this to him. But I was just sitting there in the room, and I says, I'll tell you what to do. You bring that dog to the clinic tomorrow. And I says, don't say a word to anybody, and we'll take it for there. And I've thought ever since that day why I did that, I have no idea. It had to be the man up above <laughs> that told me. But he brought that dog to the clinic, and, I mean, he had it on a chain, and if it could reach him in a yard from your feet, if it could reach a sheep, it would just grab it, pull it down, it would have worried it. No one way it would stop your head over the head. And I watched it for about two or three minutes. And I said, give it to be him. Of course, in these days, you know, I was pretty determined. And maybe still on, but I mean, I was determined. And I'm working with this dog, and I, I tried everything, maybe for about three minutes, and I was getting nowhere. And all of a sudden, he just went to grab the sheep one time, and I said, hey. And I saw something, I have no idea what, and I just bent down, and I caught this, this, the collar and the chain, and I threw it out the ring. And I said, I don't need that. And that was on the Friday morning. And I worked that dog Friday afternoon, maybe five minutes. Pretty pretty rough, but it was no on the chain. Saturday morning, Saturday evening, five minutes. And on Saturday evening, I said, we'll work this dog in the field. And I was saying, I'm 250 yards, I could stop him. And that's the dog that taught me all this. That dog started to teach me, and I've, I've just studied it ever since. It's not the correction you give. So if you go back to the people that you're teaching, you know, it's not what you correct them with, it's the freedom behind the correction. So if we can correct someone and just let them have their own way, once they're wrong, once or twice, they, they start to listen to you. And that's all come through the dogs. Hmm. I don't know yeah, if that's, that's making sense. That's them, it's really what yeah. changed me. And I, Ever since then, I changed my mind about dogs. I started, instead of using so much force, and uh, I take more and more away. I don't believe in it. And I find that dogs change three times easier. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, you, you said a lot there, Jack. That's a lot to unpack, um, a lot to think about. It, it reminds me a lot of, um, I was down in Texas about three weeks ago at one of Buck Branneman's clinics. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was a horse that a guy had brought to the clinic and it, you know, it was really, um, bothered in its mouth. And I mean, that was just one of many, many problems. Um, but to the, to the clinic goer who brought the horse, he thought it was a horse with a sensitive mouth and he thought a bunch of things, you know. And so Buck kind of debunked all that and said, you know, basically you haven't addressed anything and this horse just doesn't know anything. And now it's, it's just really troubled and obviously doesn't get along with you, you know, and it was the kind of horse, you know, like Joe mentioned, we ride horses for people and I was kind of sizing it up like, yeah, that looks like maybe once a year you get a horse like that. And, uh, and it's pretty tricky. It just takes you a while to build some rapport and, um, and get anything done. And, uh, so, so Buck let the guy mess with him for a little while and just things weren't going good with that horse at all. And, uh, so Buck stopped the clinic and made a point out of going over and working with that horse. And it took him maybe 
10 minutes to get a change and not just a change, but that horse liked him and the horse was given to him. And I mean, you know, this horse was all tight in its neck, just, yeah. just so tight. It looked ugly as sin. And after those 10 minutes, and then Buck had his assistant riding it around a little bit, that horse's neck, the anatomy had changed. The muscles were different. And I couldn't help but thinking that horse, if I got that horse in for training, it would be 30 days before I got that horse to where he was feeling back to me and, and liked me. And it wouldn't even be that much of a change as Buck got in 10 minutes. And, yeah. uh, and yeah, he absolutely, you know, that's, that's a lot of practice, but that's a guy who's, who's working off of a lot less, a lot less pressure and a lot more feel, I guess. Yeah. Um, you've got to use, you've got to use pressure to a point, but you've got to watch. Well, for me, anyway, what I watch is the dog's mind the whole time. When I'm using any type of pressure, I don't want to overpressure that mind to make that dog do what I want. I want that dog. All I want to do with pressure is get that dog to think. And if I can get it to think, then I can get it to change. And when it changes, it's going to like me. It's huge to the dog. That's far better than any reward you can ever give a dog. When he feels that your change and you feel his, so what is that but back to respect? Respecting each other, trusting each other. And they never forget it. That's an amazing thing. That dog, by the way, that I told you about wanted to be a trial dog. Hmm. But wow. he just he just been maybe started wrong, there's something no right in him. But you know, I've worked, I trained, gosh, I've no idea how many dogs I've worked and trained over the years, but it, it'll be thousands and thousands. And it gets easier and easier simply because you study the dog. If you study the dog, the dog will tell you what you're doing wrong. But that's the most difficult thing for anybody to do. We all think we're right. But if you can yeah. get that dog to want you to be right, then you're getting somewhere. It's a whole bit. It's it's just a different, whole different philosophy for me. I possibly changed more myself in the last three years than I've ever changed. And you know what the big change is? I finally started to believe in myself. I never believed in myself. The dogs have given me that little gift is believing in what you do and if you do it and do it fairly there's a huge answer at the end of the road hmm. so so what do you feel like happened three years ago because you know by by all accounts it was prior to that you were pretty competent at your craft you know so well, it was good, but I just I think what happened in the past fear I'll, I'll go four years, but I know even in the last two years a lot of uh, I just think completely different about dogs. Um, I think what it was going back to the Jaws story that was that that guy had that dog nicknamed Jaws because he was always biting, you know, and uh, going back to that. It all comes from there. I, I, I saw that it was the freedom behind the correction that worked for that dog. When I gave, he gave. And I, I've studied it ever since. I've studied it, that freedom. I mean, when a dog's wrong, I'm going to correct it. But I very seldom ever go forward to make a dog right. You'll see people go and point or I'll make a dog stay or I'll make a... I don't do, do that. The only time I'm going forward is to correct and the second that dog takes a correction, I step to the side and give it its sheep again or its cows or whatever you work at. So you're always giving it what it was bred to do. You're never taking that away. That's something that's pretty hard to get people to believe, but it, it works. It works 100%. Hmm. 
And I would say in the last two or three years, I've seen it more and more and more. Why do you think people struggle with that? Because, like Ben was saying, there's a lot of parallels with horses. And it's not necessarily a complex concept, but it's seems like it's very hard to apply. Why do you think that is? I think because your goals are wrong. If your goals is just to be a winner, you're going to do it at any cost. My goal was never just to be a winner. If I was doing things with my dog just to win and wasn't comfortable with what I was doing, I wasn't happy. So over the years, these things have corrected themselves inside me. Um, I think it's, I don't know how to explain it any better than that, but, you know, it's easy to take a dog, make it sit, make it stay, make it come, make it do this, make it do that. But there's a very simple way to get that, and it doesn't take near as long. Mm-hmm. Mm. Jack, uh, I'd be interested to hear what you think of. I, I kind of have a. I, I know what I I think about that, and that's that. Um, I I think that all people are are not very good at that. We all struggle with that that type of thing, having the right goal and then applying that correctly. And then you know, there's probably some people that naturally have a little better ability than others, but. If you just have a mediocre life, you, it might not bother you. But anyone that aspires to have a great relationship with somebody or aspires to have a great, you know, working dog or a horse or have a big company or whatever, now you have these problems you're faced with and then it brings it out of you. But it's a good thing. Now you have an opportunity to learn how to have respect and learn how to do less. But most people given that situation would would have trouble aligning themselves with the with the proper way to do it um just not everybody aspires to do it as well so those that aspire to do it well have to work through that i think it all goes back to what do you think yourself you know when you're making that statement that brought to mind, I was doing a clinic in California one year, and it was the first morning. And I'm sure if you, as you go to clinics, you'll meet these people. But there was a guy there; he didn't get into the clinic. This guy, and he stood at the gate of the ring the whole morning, and he had his dog there, and he just bugged me the whole morning. I mean, he, he was getting a little under my skin, but I never said a word. I just, and I came. When I broke for lunch that day, I said, any questions before the break? And uh, nobody said anything. And when I came to that gate, that guy was there. He says, what you're doing is not working. I says, what do you mean? And I'd been watching him, you know. He was taking his dog and he was cho- doing what I was doing and p- choking it and going on the whole morning. He says, well, I've been doing what you're doing. It's not working. I says, give your dog a minute. And I just took him in the ring and I come to the gate and I went, look at that. I just flipped his chain and I took it off and I said, now watch him. Open that gate. And I'd walk to the gate and that dog would go to the gate and said, hey, hey, hey. And he was back at my feet. All oh, just within a second. So how did I get that? Because somebody had rubbed me their own way. <laughs> and my determination, see, it's just another link that gives you a little bit extra. <laughs> So sometimes you need it to be rubbed the wrong way and sometimes, but if you let the other side go, then you start making the answers. Mm -hmm. So early on, did you struggle quite a bit? I know you mentioned you watched that one gentleman, the the fellow who competed in your first competition, who who gave you that compliment. Um, Was there anybody else that you looked up to and and got to work with as mentors that – helped you get to where you are? There's a lot of people, you know, I think the biggest help, uh, 
Every God, that guy that was talking about, he had a dog named Western Cup, which is maybe one of the most famous dogs that's ever been. And he won the international with him when he was a year and a half old. And I always remember going to him and saying, I didn't know him that well, but I went up to him and I congratulated him for winning the international. And I said, what's the best advice you could give a young guy like me starting out? He said, if it's advice you want, Jack, go ask the master. And he says, the master is J.M. Wilson. But he says, if you want to do what I did, go watch the master. And that would be wise words for anybody. Watch the person that's better than you. Don't try to be better than them. There's usually a reason. And the thing that has taught me maybe more than any person has been the dogs. I've watched these dogs. I've studied them. And the more I study them, I think to myself, how could I no see that years ago? Because I wasn't looking. You know, if we look for a goal, sometimes we're looking for the goal, but not seeing how to get it. Yeah. Like and you know, when I think right? back and Ray Hunt and all these people, well, I never got the chance to meet Ray. He knew me and was always going to meet, but he never did. But I feel like I knew him. And, and you know, like, say, I've met back and I, quite a lot of different horse people. And, and it's all the same thing. I mean, it, it's, I think it's animals know far more than people ever think they do. I was doing a clinic once, and you might get something out of this, but it was a Tom Dorns story. And I met I met Bill Dorns. He came to one of my clinics once. I could have stopped the clinic and spent the whole day with him. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. uh, uh, this lady that is she she's an older lady had come to a clinic in California, and he was sitting at night, you know, just like he said when he were out for dinner, and and she says. You know, John, uh, I need to tell you this story. I know you'll get a big kick out of it. And it was, she had a party at her place that night after the clinic. And she said, she said there was a skinny up in a big plateau and down below was a big meadow. And she said, who had a derves and things sitting out there. And they were sitting having drinks in the derves. And Tom was sitting there and he must have looked down at the meadow and he said, that's a good-looking horse. And the lady says, it is a good horse. But he says, it's got, she says, it's got one big problem. And he said, what's that? He said, he can't catch it. And he never said a word. And he sat for about five minutes, and all of a sudden he got up, and he went across to the edge of the plateau, and he just kind of moved back and forth, but that horse started to watch him. And when the horse started to watch him, he sat down. And he saw it a minute or two, and the horse went away back to Greece. And when he went back to Greece, he picked up a little pebble, and he threw it up in the air, and it hit the ground down in the middle. And that horse, you know, a horse will snort and back up and go forward and back up and go forward. It finally got up to that little pebble, and it sniffed all around him. Then it went away back to Greece. That time, Tom got up, and he went around the edge of the plateau and down into the meadow till the horse saw him. And as soon as the horse saw him, he sat down, and the horse went right through the same procedure until finally it went up and he could put his hand on it and rub it. And he got up and he walked back up to the gate, and she said that horse was never, ever hard to catch again. So I got miles out of that story, just miles. Huh. Mm -hmm. That's what he did, wow, he just changed, changed the mind inside the horse, you know without even touching it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's... It, I mean, they're they're all cool, but golly, it's, it's both of the Dorrance brothers, it seems like there's... Or I know there's more than two, but... There were seven, like, seven brothers, I believe, and... Yeah. What Bill told me was the best one was the, the one died. And he, he said yeah. he was really good. But Tom... He said got most the biggest opportunity because he went away to train horses where they kind of stayed on the ranch and 
but very interesting people, you know, just. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, um, yeah, I think that, I mean, you can never be, you can never be mad about the era you're born. Cause it's just not a lot of, not a lot of sense in getting upset about that. But myself and, and Ben is kind of included in this pretty much all the people we learn from are kind of from that Tom Dorrance, Ray Hunt train yeah. of thought. And that, that is one thing. If I, if I, if I could wave a magic wand, I'd get to see them work some horses. Cause I was, I was too young to get to see any, any of that stuff. But yeah, it seems like there's, there's stories like that. You know, it, every new person we talk to has some sort of Tom Doran story or Bill Doran story, something mm-hmm. like that. And it's, yeah. um, you know, the, the thing that you're talking about, like watching the dogs, um, something like it, it's all awareness, right? Yeah. Because it, you know, it, I, the little bit that I have grown in my horsemanship since I've started really pursuing this, all the little aha moments watching a horse or, or figuring something out. It's, I don't ever feel like it's something that I did that like a normal person couldn't have done. It's just, you're not aware of it until you are right. Cause you're not looking in the right place. And, and all those Dorrance brother stories, that seems to be the common theme in my mind, at least is they just had an exceptional level of awareness. Anytime they were around their animals, they, they could see things and, and kind of process that better than the average person. Yeah. I would say that, you know, they cared about their animals it wasn't just getting the best out of the care about how the animal was. I feel that one of the things I find the hardest for me is nowadays I sometimes can see a dog and in my own mind I think I could just go and help that person and change that dog. But I can't let myself do that because I don't want to hurt people's feelings. I don't want, I don't think I'm any better than you guys. You guys can do what I do. Without any doubt. But the biggest answer I have to it is freedom to be wrong. And very, very few people will give anybody anything freedom to be wrong because they want it to be right. But you know, every wrong that's corrected makes a right. Every time you try to make a right, doesn't always make it. It often makes a wrong. So it's, yeah. it's switching that mind around to see that. And, and the dogs has helped me just enormous. No, just in dog life and human life, you know, just watching and yeah. listening to people. And uh, I mean, I enjoy, I meet a lot of horse people nowadays that comes to clinics that just come and watch or, I have a good friend I met years and years ago and he came by my clinic and he would always keep coming and he always says, I'll never stop. I'll always find something new when I come to your clinic, something you do. And I have no idea what you, I couldn't tell you what, but so I think it's, you know, um, I think it, a lot depends on people and what their goals and their desires are. You know, we all want to be famous and we all want to be rich or whatever, but to me, richness comes on how you achieve it. Hmm. What I've achieved in the dogs, I'll spend the rest of my life giving back to the dogs. I don't want to ever take anything away from them. I don't want to take anything away from people I help with the dogs. It's all yeah. just give and correct and look for the answers. And the answers you find is a success story that you get. 
and it's sticking me to where I am today anyway. You know, it's... When I first met Cathy, she'd never seen a dog. Well, she'd seen dogs, but she hadn't seen Border Collies. And she come and worked for me for a while, and then I, I could see right away she had a passion for the dogs, you know, and she just started... I said one day you would like to learn to train them and she started and I think it was 95 she worked with first lady to win the national finals yeah. mm -hmm. and she's just come leaps and bounds and it's a little bit different method it's kind of like in your horse uh, world I mean there's a lot of different types of trainers mm -hmm. but so yeah that when I talked to Kathy, she kind of alluded to that a little bit that you guys maybe have um, some different methods. Uh, that is really interesting to me, especially because you guys are married to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I don't know about the dog world, but I, I know um, from time to time in the horse world, things can get pretty tribal in terms of how people start addressing the education of their horses, you know. Um, and it can get to where, you know, some people won't even talk to each other, let alone, you know, be married and share a house with them if they've got a different philosophy. So, you know, it is kind of a little different dynamic because obviously she had to learn a lot from you before she started thinking about this other stuff. But how is that? How have you guys managed that over the years? Because I'd say there's probably, there are couples out there that, maybe couldn't handle having that different method or philosophy or whatever you're going to call it. I think that, again, if I was answering that in an honest way, I would give it back to, to my dogs. I think if I watch my dogs and I watch some people train their dogs, and see the happiness in my dogs that I never need to make, I never need to make my dog happy. He's always happy or she's always happy. Even little puppies. I mean, I can get a puppy. I've won 14 weeks old right now. Uh, and th this is just a little example. Kathy doesn't like to take a little puppy and chain it up or, or do anything. But I'm the opposite. You see, I grew up always wanting to be like my dad. I never knew my mother. My mother died when I was... Was only, I was only two, I think, and, and I never knew her. So my dad basically raised me, him and my sisters, and, and I just always kind of idolised them. I never hardly remember ever getting a correction from my dad, but I never needed one. If he was mad or unhappy, I was about crying. And that philosophy goes through to my dogs today. So when you go back into, you know, like Cathy and I, I don't look at that side of life at all. I don't I don't try to, I don't want to be better. I don't want to be better than anybody else. That's not my philosophy and and what I do. What I do the dogs has given me and it works. It works a hundred percent. I mean I wouldn't sit here and say it if I didn't believe it. And I think the biggest problem with people is they don't ever want to be wrong. What is wrong with being wrong if you're going to end up being right? But it's very hard, and people fight it every day. So relationships, friends, I see friends fall out over nothing. And I think to myself, why? Why would he not speak to your friend over a simple thing? And then I've watched these dogs and I'll be in a fight and it's over and it's past and they're never anymore. Yeah. Mm. It's a forgiveness, you know. Uh, yeah. If you can forgive and forget, I'll not say maybe ever forget things, but he, the forgiveness part is huge to me and uh, Especially working with the dogs and livestock and such like. Right. Yeah. Well, and the dogs don't. 
they don't bottle things up, right? You know, Buck says that about horses. If if there is if there's an issue in a herd, it gets settled before the sun goes down. Yeah. And then that's it. And then they're at, and then they feel good about it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I think it's because they have to feel good. They don't have options. You know, we're living in a world today where as people grow up and, y- and younger people come along, they get more of what they want all the time. Whereas, like in a, a herd of horses, it was running wild. When the, when the one took over, the, the others followed it, or, or vice versa, you know. And I just think that that's the difference between praise and correction to me. I'm no believer in any type of harsh correction. I mean, I'm firm with a dog if it needs it, but I don't want to be unfair. It has the same chance as me. I mean, if a dog's going to bite me, I'm not going to just let it bite me. I'm going to, you know, just the same as if it was biting the sheep or biting the cow. But it doesn't need to bite all the time. So it's... It brings up the word to me, what is control? Control is a terrible thing, if you make it. But control is a very good thing, eh? if you allow it to happen on its own. So that's the difference, I would say, for me nowadays with my dogs, to what I maybe once was. I was more in wanting that control at one point, whereas nowadays... I don't want it if it's not going to come. It'll come and it'll be right. When you make control, I don't think it's ever right. Hmm. So I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> ask you, how did you go from managing these kennels and working dogs to doing seminars and or clinics, you know, whatever you want to call them? Um what what was your decision to pivot into doing that? Well, what happened was it just let one thing just led to another. I mean, my life's just been like a fairy tale. <laughs> you know, <laughs> really when I look back, I mean I, I would never believed what would have happened. If somebody had said I would have had my own ranch and living here, I would have said, You're crazy. But when I went and moved to Wisconsin to the guy, you know, and I went into partnership with him, and then he offered me the place on a lease, and then I started my kennel. Well, when I started the kennel, I started going more in the circuit, and I was pretty successful way back in the oh, early 80s, up to 90s. I did a lot of competition, and then I was being asked to judge and such. And the first clinic I ever did was at Auburn University. And I was asked to go and judge a sheepdog trial there. And it was pre-vet students, and they couldn't come up with the money. And they asked if I would do a clinic. And I said, no way. I said, I wouldn't have a clue how to even start. But they talked me into it. And you talk about being nervous. I was nervous before that clinic. (laughs) And every clinic I've done since has all been word of mouth. I've never advertised for a clinic in my life. I just Mm. go places and somebody will say, would you come here or come there? And it's just all snowballed. So it's it's kind of like the story of what I'm telling you with the dogs, you know, changing from being controlling to correcting and giving them a chance to give. I think it's so huge. Mm. So do you think, you know, earlier you said that the dogs have helped you to, to learn how to teach people have the have teaching people helped you be better with your dogs I mean I assume you know you said you were nervous doing your first clinic but then not just that you like did you have to come up with things for them to do and and did that start you down the road of having more of like a never been a versus clinic. just you out there working with your dogs I'd never been at a clinic in my life I hadn't so a clue. You didn't even what know what it was to supposed to be. No, I didn't know even what I was going to tell him. I just said, bring another dog. Yeah. <laughs> and it just all. But so through doing work- it all, all the answers has come. 
rather than so did you, he tried to plan it or make it. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's no. all right. We're, we got a little delay again. Were you working one dog at a time? How did you set something like that up for the first one? Usually one dog at a time. And like when I work a dog, I only want it five minutes. I don't want it for half an hour. A lot of people want to work a dog half an hour or longer. I don't. Why? Because I'm not getting food. If I keep it longer, I'm going to start putting force on. My my patience my patience lasts a bit that long, you know. And and I've learned that if you wait, answers come. If you push, answers leave, and they never come. So, I think patience is a big part of. Uh, patience is a big part of life. You're talking about Kathy and I. I mean, it's just being patient and understanding and understanding how people I mean I understand how people want to succeed but if we all wanted to succeed and could exceed everybody would be perfect it's not possible what we want in life that you're not going to get it all but the rich parts is the parts that's given. That's been my experience anyway. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a big question that faces anybody entering the industry is, uh, you know, how they're going to succeed. And, and I don't know. I mean, you could tell us if things were different back, you know, we say back in the day. But, you know, today, you know, I know a lot of <clears throat> other young guys and gals that are, getting into, you know, let's say the horse industry and they have really good heart, you know, and they want to, you know, they aspire to do basically what you've been saying, you know, not, um, not betray their animals, treat them right, put that first, make that the, the centerpiece of what they do with their business. But at the same time, you know, you have, you know, we're roped into so many bills and deadlines and you're trying to keep up with modern life. And so that, that question certainly weighs on everybody's mind. I think that yes, I'm going to stay true to the horse or the dog, but but I've got to make this payment and I got to do that. And what about this and what about that? And um, do you feel like things have changed for someone coming into the industry now versus when you got started, or did you kind of grapple with the same sort of thoughts? Like, of course, you had you had the way you wanted to be worked out in your mind, but you still had to kind of make that happen and, and still exist in the real world where there's deadlines and payments and obligations and things that you have to figure out how to make a living. Even if you're trying to be ethical. Well, I think it, humans have done that to themselves. I don't think you can blame the animals for that. It's us to blame. I mean, I don't know what you like with a baby coal, but I know what people are like with a baby puppy. And they spoil it to death. And they give it everything. And then when they start to train it, they want everything. And when they don't get it, they get abusive sometimes. They get mad. They get, they don't think. So why do I talk about a mind? My puppy's mind starts whenever it's old enough to use it. And I try to train that puppy to understand me. I don't train it. I don't go out and train it to work sheep or do this or do that. But I try to let it understand me. And the main thing that I look for in a puppy when it starts is respect. So that if my puppy was chasing a leaf across the yard and I said, hey, if he looked and said, what? That's enough for me. That's an answer. But for humans, that's not enough. They would say, hey, you just stop doing that. You come here at once. They'd never leave the dog or the animal the chance to make a choice. So going back to your question and what you was asking, I think that's where that's come from. 
if you think well, way back, say, 30, 40 years ago, how horses was treated compared to how we treat them today and what it takes to raise a horse and, you know, everything has to be perfect because we want that perfect horse or we want that perfect dog. I don't look at that way at all. I don't need a fancy kennel. I don't need a... If I'm bringing a fancy kennel, it's going to be for the people to watch and look at it. I don't want to be known as that. I want to have the dog that can show and... That's where the real insight is in your animal. And I think we get away from that sometimes with our goals. And in saying that, I hope people understand I'm not against people. I mean, I, I, I want people to be happy, but if they want to get the happiness that I've found, the real richness of it is in the animals we work with. Hmm. Yeah, that's, if I uh... could make everybody happy, I would never need to even travel. <laughs> 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 but, you know, you have to just... I just feel lucky that I've been gifted with these things that I can get a dog to change or get and pass it on to people and and make a living through it. But if I took that and put it on to your question, so I have this puppy and I want it to be good, I'm going to put all this expense into it and then it's going to cost me all this. Yeah. That's the wrong way around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we start thinking about I'm going to put in this much effort and this much money, and I yeah. better get this return. Yeah, and it's this equation that's in your head, and that yeah. kind of starts to drive your life. I mean, there's a lot of people, and and I don't mean I don't mean this in any bad way, but I mean the the whole goal is to go and win the national finals or go and win the world trials. That's why I never went now. It would never bother me. I don't need to go and win the world trial if I think I've got a dog that can. That's what I want. I want the dog. It always is going to give me what I need. I don't have to do it. But we're something guilty wanting to be out in the spotlight. Hmm. Um, I hope I've not thought of it that way anyway, because I don't I don't want to think of myself that way. I just want to be me and give what yeah. these dogs have given to me. It's mm -hmm. well and and that too kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier. You know, having a dog that you believe has that ability and would give that to you, that's kind of similar to, you know, you believing in yourself which was a big revelation for you, it sounds like. You know, it, if you believe in yourself, then you don't necessarily need the accolades to prove it, right? Yeah. And I think, it, you know, when you say that, uh, I had a very good friend, the late John H. Wilson, who was one of the tops in the dog world in Britain. I mean, he was, he, he was I don't know how many internationals he won and he won three at least and maybe four a lot of these scottish nationals he, he was a top guy he trained every dog he ever owned but he always used to say to me he always called me Knox, and he always said you know your problem Knox." and i would say i didn't know i had one johnny he said you don't believe in yourself and you know the times i've thought about that and when i used to compete and thing i didn't believe in myself and he would always say, you're as good as anybody who ever walks the post. You just don't believe you are. And now, I finally, I'm beginning to look at dogs and see what dogs has given me. And it's making me believe in. But it took the dog to do it. It wasn't people. It's the dogs. And I've got nine, nine dogs right now. But I've, I can honestly say I've never had dogs like them. Every one of them I like. I like every dog. I don't train, train them much. But I don't need to. So it's mm. it's just sometimes I feel lucky. 
and other times I think, well, it can't all be luck. You've got to be doing some things that's right. But um, I can't go by giving the credit to the dogs. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I've met a lot of fine people, top people, but my educator's been the dogs themselves. Hmm. And what educates the dog is the animal he work, whether it's a cow or a sheep, and it's how he work it. So, th this has been, well, first off, this has been an awesome conversation, Jack. Um, th this is really cool stuff, and I'd like to, I, I think this is really up Ben and I's alley. Um, but there was, there was one other thing I wanted to touch on just cause we've got you, we've kind of got you in a captive audience here and it, it makes me super curious. Obviously you're with this whole deal. You're training, um, border collies mainly, mm -hmm. um, from my understanding. And it's probably what you grew up with in Scotland. Um, what, why border collies and what do you feel like they offer that maybe a different breed doesn't? And I'm not trying to knock other breeds. I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Cause being a clinician, you've probably dealt with a lot of these different stock breeds and the limited exposure I've had. There's some very different, I don't know. I don't know if it's the people or the dogs, but maybe certain type of people are um, drawn to certain types of breeds, but there's very different ways they seem to approach the stock and how the stock responds, you know? I think that um, the way I would answer that, first of all, I was, I was raised around border collies, basically, maybe more so than other breeds. And that was the normal work dog. I mean, there was a few beardies in Scotland, uh, but mainly border collies. But I think the difference between a border collie and a lot of other breeds is they're one of the few dogs that was bred for brains and working ability. They weren't bred for looks. And if you look at border collies, the big ones, the small ones, the short coats, the rough coats, or different colours, or they're mainly black and white, but I think it, that speaks of volume. But the thing that Border Collies has as far as a work tool for me, they have the three ingredients that I look for in a good dog. And balance is the first one. So what is balance? It's a contact part, point, you know. It's, it's like a good dog, if he's watching stock right, she can move his eyes and steer them. He doesn't need to move right and left. He should be able to steer them from the contact spot. Some dogs can be closer. Some dogs need to be further away. And then the next thing I want is the power. It's no use having a dog back here. It can steer if he can't push. So what is power? Power all comes through the dog's body structure, how he moves, his eye, his contact on the stock. A good dog that's got the right eye and contact will move livestock without needing to bite. And there are very few of them left. Why? Because we want the quick answer. We don't look at what we need. We want quick answers. We want to win. That's the bottom line. Hmm. So to me, I always tell my students, the winner is the one that's getting better. You're a winner if you're improving. But everybody can't win. So. Yeah. That's, a, that's a pretty good place to wrap it up, huh, Joe, for a podcast called On the Move. The winner is the guy that's improving, or gal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're you've at said the bottom, a lot of stuff, Jack. When you're at I was going to say, you said a lot of stuff tonight that, like, 
you ought to put on a bumper sticker or something. There, you've, you've had a lot of good one-liners tonight. And that that's right there at the top. Well, I, I think it. You know, there's no such a thing as a failure. If you fail, you're going to get better. You can be a winner. It doesn't mean you're going to stay one. Yep. Um, Jack, you have a you have a book, right? Where can people find that? What's it called? Landing Life's Lessons with Stock Dogs. That's a it's pretty a apt title. Day. Well, that was that was the people that uh, it was the author the name it did the title part, but it, uh, it's basically what I believe in. It's all been learning through the dogs and learning life's lessons. So a lot of the human things that I believe in in life now has come through the dogs and what they've given and shown. Well, it's sure been a pleasure uh, talking with you tonight because I know you've given me a lot of food for thought and, yeah. and a little different perspective. You know, like Joe said, we're, we're pretty gung-ho on the – on the horse deal and uh and will continue to be but you know you get kind of hunkered down in your lane and um so listening to you talk about the dogs there's a lot of similarities but there's also some there's some parallel things that it could change the way a fella you know worked with his horses or the way you expect um all of your goals and plans in life to um lay out in front of you um <laughs> So I appreciate that. It's just me. I just who I am. And, you know, um, I often look back in life and think, you know, if I wanted to push life and be bigger and grow more, maybe I could have. But would I have been happier? No, I wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. So. That's all. Well, Jack, we... um I tell you what, we really appreciate you making the time to talk with us tonight. Mm -hmm. um, it's I know it's been you're, a pleasure. It's maybe not yeah. what you wanted to hear, but it's me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's exactly what we wanted, man. And and like I said, you know, talking with Kathy, I know you guys travel and you keep busy schedules, so um, it means a lot to us that you take the time to say, um, sit down and talk with us. You know, kind of like. You were saying your mentor, he'd taken, um, or the guy you admired, I should say, um, your idol, taking the time to um, just make a little comment to you. Like, th there might be someone out out there, um, and Ben and I are probably included. That um, words words of wisdom from people who have good, what I think is a good perspective on life, that means a lot, especially when you're kind of starting out and 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 looking for direction still. So. It means a lot that you take the time to talk with us, and we really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I appreciate the chance that I've talked with you, and I just appreciate everything I've had the opportunity to to gain, and I want to try to give it to the people as much as I can as long as I'm here. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks well, so much. Okay. Don't hang up, but we are going to stop recording here. So, okay. okay.